Hello again and welcome to War Stories, behind the scenes tales from the front lines of the media. I'm your host, Tom Curley. Welcome to show number six. Today is a very special show. It's a first, a first, a first, a first. We not only have my cohort in crime, the inevitable Gary Armstrong, but we also have a new cohort in crime, Mr. John Corcoran. John, welcome to War Stories. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to find myself anywhere, as a matter of fact, at this age. But I'm, I'm glad to be part of this gang. I've uh, grown to know you guys and think of you as family. Exactly. Now, uh, I, a little backstory. Um, one of the reasons that, that you're here is that uh, you and Gary correspond quite a lot. And one of the things that you do is you tend to, tend to do what this show is. You tell tell stories. It's almost like a competition. Now, you would ask, how do I know this? Well, Gary has me on the mailing list. Now, I don't think he knew that I was on the mailing list. Um, and who knows how many other people. So basically, I would... Normally, I would just delete it, but I would eavesdrop and go, they were really rather entertaining. And so anytime one of these things popped up, I would read it. And when we started doing war stories, uh, one of the first people I suggested to Gary was, hey, how about John? So anyway, John, uh, tell us uh, back in the days when you did work, uh, what is it that you actually did? Uh, where did you work? How did you come up with these crazy stories? And trust me, they're pretty funny. Well, so, some are pretty weird. Yeah, I, you know, I started out as a, <clears throat> when I got out of the military, the first thing I did is I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> Very professional, John. Thank you. Uh, and I got, I got in, uh, out of the military. I got I moved back to Washington, D.C., where I uh, started writing for the, uh, the city magazine there quite a bit. And eventually, through a series of details that nobody would care about, I got into uh, television and uh entertainment and television and the first thing i did is i reviewed television on television and then when the abc affiliate i worked for realized how little i liked most of abc's programming they made me a movie critic <laughs> because uh, you know they were not fond of having their shows ripped on their own but i gotta be honest you know i was supposed to be honest so i was and uh that turned into me being the regular uh, movie critic there. And that led to a, my uh, eventually moving out to LA with a couple of gigs, back to Boston, um, and then uh, uh, WNEV, it was then called, I believe. Yeah. And uh, then again, back to LA and where I've since retired or been retired as the case may be. And you know, that, that, that's basically my backstory. I have a front story, but it's less interesting. <laughs> so uh, that sounds we well go. that's that's <laughs> john you have probably more of these war stories than anyone i've come across well i've got a few and... yeah I, which one do you want i got i got war stories i got stories i got stories i got well, makeup on the spot okay let's let's do this stephen colbert the other night had um Steven Spielberg and John Williams on the show, and that was really funny. And lo and behold, I we find out you have a Spielberg story. I have a Spielberg story. Yeah, uh, we each get one when we live in L.A. No, it. Uh, I have a couple of them actually. The uh, the first of which occurred at the director, I believe, the Directors Guild, and back in the day, they used to invite <clears throat> the the critic. In many cases, the critics, as I was and uh, uh, they're plus one to their events, their annual award ceremony. And I was invited to this and, with my wife and we're, we're sitting at a table and next thing you know, Spielberg is standing basically next to me where he's being congratulated for winning, I think for the color purple and uh, director's killed award. And my wife who, who's very helpful, she said, Go talk to him. Go talk. There's Stephen. He's right there. Go introduce yourself. I said, I'm not going to introduce him. He's, you know, he's talking to producers and people, and he's got things that are important. He said, No, just go say hello to him. Will you? I said, No, I don't think. Will you please? Okay. So <laughs> I got up and I said, and this, and honest to God, if he'd stop talked talking after the first sentence, I'd be the happiest man on earth. He said, I said, uh, 
Stephen, I'm John Corker with KBC Television. I'm a critic there, and I want uh, I want you to know you should have won for ET, but I'm glad you did win for the color purple. He says, I know you are, John. You're the only critic I watch. Uh, what the? What the <laughs> heck? Steven Spielberg said, I'm the only critic. I'm the only critic Steven Spielberg watches. Well, I must be something special. And then he said, yeah, I used to date the woman who was a co-anchor on your show. And uh, I still like to check in on her. <laughs> <laughs> so up the road, down with the ego. It comes with the territory. But uh, no, that, that is... was... Yeah, I got I got a chance to interview him a couple times, uh, including once was uh, for some reason the this year the Academy decided to take three people, three of the the people who were covering it, and give us a special shot of the people right after they had won, and they set us up uh, just off uh, I think it was at the door of the Chandler Pavilion then before they built the the beautiful facility they use now, and we went down there and stood up a camera and. Boom, there's Steven Spielberg. I'm the second guy to talk to him right after he won. And it went, it, I thought it went pretty well. I was, I was pretty happy with the interview. You know, it's live. It's, uh, nobody's watching because they're actually watching the Academy Awards. But still, people back in the station are watching. And, and I want to do a good job. And I thought it went pretty well. And uh, got back to the station. And I was very delighted to see several notes on my typewriter from people at the stations who, who thought I did a very good job with them. So that, that meant a lot to me because you don't want to mess up with a guy like that. You want to you do a, a pretty good creative job, a, a good uh, good questions and not dumb questions, and it worked out pretty well. But he's the, he's quite a guy. I, and I thought Colbert, by the way, I, I, you mentioned you saw him, Gary. Uh, I thought Colbert did a superb job. I thought that was you know, high quality all the way through with him and with, with John Williams. Yep, yep. Yeah, I, I watched it. You. Great. Excellent, excellent leadoff story. Great. So, Gary, um, we're getting back to the, uh, uh, the the celebrity tales. You have a couple of good ones uh, involving, I believe it was George Raft and uh, Jimmy Cagney. So uh, what's that all about? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, we have to, when we, when, we, when we thread our way back to John, we have to ask him some more about them. Um, uh, some of his red carpet interviews and people who approached him offering themselves for red carpet interviews. And I, John is dialing up that story in his brain right now. But uh, George Raft and James Cagney, uh, for, for those of a certain age, they'll remember those two actors as being prominent uh, in the uh, 1930s Warner Brothers gangster movies. Uh, George Raft, I met back in, I think it was 1971. I was Fairly st I, I was still new to Boston, but they sent me out to um, City Hall Plaza to interview George Raft, and no one told me why. It turns out Raft was uh, the spokesperson for a senior citizens organization, a national senior citizens organization. And I don't know why it was called what it was called, but it was called Mob, Mob George Raft Gangster Movies. So there we are face-to-face -face in City Hall Plaza. Now, the fanboy part of me was kind of excited. George Raff was still, you know, an interesting figure at that point. So I walked up to him, introduced myself, and he just stared at me. I introduced myself again, and I started in to ask him about his uh, charitable organization, and he kept looking at me. And finally he said, Mr. Raff, I'm Gary Armstrong. And he said, what? And this went around for another 10 seconds, and I realized he was wearing hearing aids, and apparently they had not been turned on. So after about three what's, uh, his, uh, his flunky said to him, George, turn on your hearing aid. And Raph says, what? So I walked over to him, showed him my hearing aids, and he said, what? And I said, do you want me to turn your hearing aids on? And he looked at his flunky, and he said, what did he say? So finally, the flunky turns on George Raft's hearing aids, and he looks at me and said, why are you here? And I said, what? And he said, kid, don't try that on me. So we went into the first question, and he didn't hear me. So I said, turn on the other hearing aid. What? So I took both of my hearing aids out, and I showed them how they work. 
I put my hearing aid back in and I said, can we go now? And he said, what? And by now the camera crew was laughing. The flunky was laughing and George Rapp pulls out a, a cigar, lights it up and says, why are we here? And someone said, George, for the interview, what? <laughs> 10 minutes had expired and I figured I'm not going to get this done. I finally grasped on something of George Raff from the past. And I said, I heard you turned down High Sierra because you didn't like dying in a movie. And I waited for the what? And he said, huh? <laughs> and I said, why don't you like dying in movies? And he said, well, I'm dead now. And I said, I think that's a wrap on the interview. George Raff, a classic. You know, it's John it's had, funny. Had, Go ahead. That's a great story. I was just going to say, uh, with John listening, whether or not he's ever encountered the likes of George Raff. Not not George Raff, but I've talked uh, many of the likes of George Raff. Yeah, <clears throat> a lot of the legends, a lot of the uh, the old timers. Sometimes they're not uh, they don't hear it well or they don't see that well, and uh, it can be fascinating sometimes as long as you're kind to them, it works out. You know, it, it's funny that does bring up something. Um, uh, they were interviewing, uh, I don't remember, he was the host of Hollywood Squares, and they had asked him, you know, who is your weirdest uh, or most memorable guest? And he said, he said, actually, it's Henny Youngman. And he said, because no matter what the question was, he would always just start his act. And, and it's true, because one time, Henny Youngman was a guest on the Joan River Show. That was back when I was doing audio for the Joan River Show. And one of our audio guys, his permanent job was to be in the green room and put the microphones on, put the wireless mics on. And he loved it because he got to meet all these celebrities. So he comes into the control room and he goes, oh, my God, guys, you, you won't believe just what just happened. He said, I had to put a mic on Henny Youngman. Now, by him, he was in his 90s. OK, he said, I had to put a mic on. I swear he was dead. I mean, I thought I thought he was dead. <laughs> and, and it's like me and the, me and the PA, we had this like lift him up and I put the microphone on and they basically sort of dragged him into the into the control room and and. <laughs> I mean, into the studio. And so they, they put him up, they sit him down, and he's like this. And Joan asks him a question, and he just comes up, take my wives, please. A guy goes into a dentist's <laughs> office. Uh, a guy says, you've got cancer, you're going to die. He says, I want a second opinion. He says, okay, you're ugly too. And he proceeded to do five minutes of Henny Youngman. And, <laughs> Youngman. and and Joan quickly realized that this was going nowhere. So she threw the commercial. <laughs> they they dragged his ass back to the green room and he went, you know, just back into coma state. So, so yeah, you know, for both of you guys. Now, here's a question. Um, I, I know a nightmare for any interviewer is the the guest that'll just go, yes, no. Or, or just, you know, drives you crazy. How, how often did that happen and how do you handle it? John? Okay, I'll go first, because uh, it happened a lot. Uh, well, it, <clears throat> we, uh, entertainment reporters, movie critics and such would go to these, what they call movie junkets, frequently in New York, sometimes LA, sometimes nice, ni other nice places, where you, they bring the stars in, they sit them in a room all day, you go in for your five minutes, do your interview with them, so on and so forth. And you know, if if one didn't talk or one wasn't interesting, you 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 know, you pass it off. You can't do it. You know, they're not going to answer you. They don't. In many cases, they didn't know what they were doing, or they didn't know why they were there. And I don't mean they're <laughs> I mean, literally didn't understand the concept of junkets, and you know, it was basically a commercial for the movie. And um, so that would happen occasionally. In which case, say, okay, I got other people. <laughs> I got movie clips and you end up putting a little piece together and not, not worry about that too much. But uh, yeah, it became an art form because you, you learn, sometimes it would be good to know, the more you know about the person, the better. For example, uh, there was, a, when Whoopi Goldberg and Ted Danson did a, a movie together, I forget the name of it. And uh, there were rumors, hot rumors that they were involved in a, in a relationship on the set so as I was uh, about to go in, I'm sitting outside waiting to go in to interview them. 
uh, one of the technicians go by and said, how's it going in there? So it's funny. You, uh, if people are asking me about the affair. And what they do is they hold up little signs that read, next question. Uh, no comment. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> Thank you for telling me that. I pull out a little, my little Sharpie and I write a little something down and put it in my pocket. And we walk in, and, and I do the interview, and I'm getting all the way through it, and I'm down to the last few minutes, and I start. And they know what I'm getting at, leading up to. I said, well, you know, I'm not the kind of guy who does these kinds of stories or interviews, but yet there's been rumors. At that point, they reach in their pockets, hold out their signs. I nod my head, reach into my pocket, hold out my sign, which I've written, says, I know what I had to ask. <laughs> And, then, and that was it. And, and Danson fell off his chair. He thought that was so funny. But he was sitting there. He said, give me extra minutes. Let's let's do close-ups. Let's do cutaways. So, it, you know, it, it amused them. And you like to do things like that. But keep, keep your interest. Keep them interested. <laughs> that's, that's wild. So, Gary, um, again, uh, the story, uh, uh, Jimmy Cagney. Uh, what was that Jimmy one about? Cagney. Jimmy, Jimmy Cagney. Cagney but that last thing that uh, you and John were talking about, the guest who shows up and is a yes and no, that's a reporter's, uh, one of a reporter's worst nightmares when you have a guest who simply doesn't go with the flow. And uh, John mentioned that they're usually selling their movies and we're doing them a favor. But the Cagney story, this again is the early 70s. I had just started uh, renting with a bunch of uh, Boston TV friends a summer house on Martha's Vineyard, and we would become regulars for the next 20 or 30 years on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, I had just gotten off the ferry in Edgartown, I believe, and I had my, 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 my bag and a garment bag over my shoulder and trying to, trying to get off as soon as possible and, and get to the, the house we were renting. And th this, this old man off to the side, and I hadn't gotten a good look at his face, kept saying, Gary Armstrong, Gary Armstrong. So finally I turned around and said, yes, I, I'm Gary Armstrong. And the old man started <laughs> saying, I, I've watched you on television and I I enjoy your work. You don't mind if I, I chat with you a little bit? And I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm on vacation or days off. And as he began to, uh, as he began the conversation talking about stories he'd seen me do, he was talking about the, the way I walked and all that sort of thing. And I realized why the face was so familiar it was james cagney and he he looked at me and when he saw that i recognized him he laughed and he said yeah 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 that's me i used to be somebody now i'm just an old man who waits for boats to come in <laughs> i i you know i was left with where do we go from here and he said you know and he lapsed into a story i had done and then asked me some more questions about the angles we had shot from and and how I did my uh, live shots, and I told them about uh, the love of dancing on a dime and ad living and all that sort of thing. And he smiled and said, that was the favorite part of the acting for me in my early days. A lot of things that were taken for granted were just ad libs. And he said, you know, we're having fun. Would you like to come down and spend some time at my cabin and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk some more about this? And in the back of my head, I said to myself, I thought, this is James Cagney. He's inviting me to have lunch with him. I said, of course. We uh, forward down to his uh, his cottage, which was anything but simple. And we sat down and he brings out, uh, as I recollect, tea or coffee and some cookies. And he sits down and he almost begins interviewing me. He's carrying the conversation, asking me what it's like to be a reporter, what it's like to be a reporter of color back in those days. And I, and I stopped him and I said, why, why, why are you asking me? And he said, well, I, you know, when I was working at one is we had to deal with a lot of a-holes and, and I know what it was like for people of color who were working those days. And I was just interested in how much flack you put up with. And I said, well, you know, I, I'm a short term, but active Marine. I have a big mouth. I love old movies and I, I, I seem to be able to get along with people. And he chuckled at that. And then he lapsed into grievances he had with Jack Warner and other directors. 
And it dawned on me that James Cagney was basically using me as his vehicle to uh, vent against people who he worked for, people who he thought, in fact, were assholes. And some of the, some of the stories he told about Jack Warner reminded me about some of the GMs I worked for. And I told those stories. And I told them one story about a, a GM who used to sit in the dark. This is when I was working at the Hartford, Connecticut station. The, the uh, news director there used to sit in the dark all the lights were out in his office and he would be chasing invisible flies. I think this, this general manager, I think he was a former boxer, if that makes any sense. Well, I'm spreading this story to Cagney. He's leaning back and laughing and, and talking about working with uh, uh, different directors and different actresses and actors. And uh, I asked him about, oh, he mentioned George Raft. He brought it up. And I let him tell me my, uh, his George Raft story. Then I told him my George Raft story. And he said, that Raft, you know, the guy is such a schmuck. And I'm sitting there and I'm laughing and realizing two hours had gone by of talking with James Cagney. And he said, do you like, do you like writing? And I said, at that point, I hadn't done much writing. I said, well, it, it, it seems to be fun. Um, so yes, he said, well, I have some horses up the road at my other farm. And I said, well, that, that, that's interesting. Well, would you like to go riding? And I said, well, Mr. Cagney, I, I only have a couple of days off here. Uh, maybe we can do it later. And he said, no problem. I've got the horses here, young man. You keep up the good work. Uh, by the way, when you're confronted by the people you have to work for that you don't get along with, and you know that they're really, in fact, stupid, do you know what you should do? And I said, no, Mr. Cagney. He said, just smile at them and walk away. That, don't get engaged in conversation with them. Just smile at them. That drives them crazy. And he said, listen, the next time we meet, we'll go horseback riding and I'll tell you more stories. And we ended up the afternoon with him saying, I'm sorry I dragged out your first day here in the vineyard. I said, you can't imagine how exciting this has been. And he said, I do. I'm an old guy and not many people talk to me anymore. James Cagney. Wow. Wow, that is absolutely amazing. And, you know, you, you did bring up a topic for, for future shows, which is um, uh, management. Uh, we've always asked the question, do managers become assholes because they were assholes to begin with? Or do they become assholes when they get made management? And I have never really had an answer to that question, although it did lead to many a lively philosophical discussion because <laughs> everybody's got a everybody's got an opinion. So so, John, you have one uh, another story. And then uh, if we've got time, I'm going to I'm going to throw you a curveball. Uh, something uh -oh. about a helicopter, uh -oh. a helicopter in the roof. What was that all about? Well, it's a, it's a story. It's not about me. It's about, you know, I, I didn't kid myself. I was not a reporter. I was an entertainment reporter. And as such, I never kidded myself that I was uh, an aggressive kind of a, the kind of guy like Gary was uh, who would get a story done. That was the key to it. My job was to entertain people, essentially. And if there was a story associated with it, to go get that, too. But um, the, the funny thing was with uh, this friend of mine named Jim Clark, who in my mind was a, one of the best reporters I've ever seen in my life. Just absolutely solid guy. And serious as can be on the air. And off the air, uh, just it'd make you laugh every five seconds. So Jim was, uh, he was doing a story uh, about, um, I can remember, remember this yarn here. Yeah, he was uh, down in Richmond, Virginia, about 100 miles away. And he was uh, driving up, and he calls into the station. Now this is, he's a reporter; he's not the general manager; he's not anything like that. But you don't you don't really tell Jim what to do much, because he was so good he could take it or leave it. And then he would usually beat everybody around him. So he he's coming back, and he calls up the, uh, the assistant manager. He says, "Listen, we're running a little late, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to get our helicopter." At this point, everybody in the in the in, uh, in Washington had a helicopter and uh, get it fired up ready to go and uh, and I'll I'll meet at the National Airport said, oh really what, what do you got so just just get the helicopter ready so he gets the, he gets the National Airport gets the helicopter and then he calls back again he says look grab an intern 
and get up on the roof. Oh, and before you get up there, break into the Red Cross emergency section and pick up a blanket. What is this guy talking about? Just do as I tell you to. <laughs> he just, so the guy gets up with the blanket and the intern. Meanwhile, here comes a helicopter and here comes a Jim Clark in the helicopter calling down, well, not calling, I couldn't hear him, but uh, uh, by radio and saying, I'm going to drop a tape down to you. I said, what? Open the blanket. I'm going to drop the tape and you'll catch it in the blanket and it'll make air. That's the kind of guy he was. If he had a story and had to make air, he'd make sure it made air. So here's the the, uh, the intern and the um, the uh, assignment manager on the roof with a, with a blanket. Now, quick uh, discussion of aerodynamics. Airplanes stay in the air by flying with the wings holding them up. We all know that. Helicopters stay in the air by pushing vast quantities of air downward at a high rate of speed. But let's let's return to our helicopter, where it's pushing air down rapidly under the roof. And under it are two bozos holding a blanket like a spinnaker. <laughs> it inflates, <laughs> and honest to God, they almost got blown off the roof before <laughs> he dropped the tape and they caught it and it made air. That was Jim Clark. That was his idea of making sure. <laughs> and, so, and afterwards, the, the, the news director calls this a Jim. You know, it was a great story and a wonderful job, but, uh, you know, you can't put these people at risk like that. What am I supposed to tell people if, if you know, the assignment manager gets gets thrown to his death off the roof. Uh, just tell him I was trying to kill the fat bastard. <laughs> that was Jim. <laughs> that was Jim. That was great. That was the great. The only after to walk into a uh, walk into a Navy, these are the two unions, uh, a Navy uh, um, editing suite, and said, "What are you editing?" And he said, "I'm doing so and so." And I'll get it. He reached in, pulled the thing out of the. You can't do that. You can't do that. <laughs> grievance. Nobody ever grieved Jim Clark. He put his taste to mine now, and that was it. But his stories were so good. He was so good. He was such a powerful presence. And uh, a sad story about how he departed this planet. He retired, and he was uh, living on a cul-de-sac uh, when, when, when a blizzard hit. And he put on his galoshes and got out his uh, snow shovel, and he cleaned off his driveway and the, uh, the sidewalk. And that wasn't enough for Jim. He then cleared off everybody's sidewalk and driveway, went back home, laid down, never got up. Yeah, he just he wow. killed himself essentially from doing an act of charity. That's the kind of guy he was. It just wow. You know, people make fun of reporters. They don't respect them enough. But some of these people are just quality people. No doubt quality about it. people. Wow. All right. So just before we leave, uh, I've. You told me a story when we first uh, started talking, and I was debating whether to do it. And then I realized, well, you know, I have to push a button that says this is for mature audiences. So, God damn it, <laughs> we're going to earn it. All right. So, John, you told me a story about a uh, – uh, there was a guy named Russ Meyer, right? Now, I don't know if people Ooh. remember Russ Meyer. He was a, he was a movie producer, right? And he I did. Uh, go ahead. He he did softcore porn. He sort of was the guy that invented softcore porn. Okay, and uh, you told me that uh, he had a, uh, a, a was a girlfriend or a wife, and I wife. believe this is a picture of her. Right, this is her wife. And uh, what was her name? Edie well, Williams, I I right? Edie go Williams, ahead. yeah. Edie Williams. Okay, now you were on the red carpet, okay? I was. And and you said you interviewed her. So tell me that story, including the punchline. What? Oh, <laughs> no, I can't tell you. Can I tell you the you punchline? You can't. Absolutely. I want. I want the whole story. The, give us. Give us the uh, story. But I'm not gonna let my kids see this one. Okay. Okay. All right, Edie. Um, <laughs> Let's put it this way. Edie was a bit of a, a publicity hound and, and, you know, it worked for her. And every year it seemed like she would manage to either get tickets herself on how she did it, or she found a boy toy one to take her. And, and she went to the Academy Awards. She go down the, down the line. Nobody really much cared to talk to her, but, 
by golly, it was it was fun to look at her. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> she outdid herself. She was dressed in. Oh, I don't know what the thread count was on this outfit, but it was not many. It was transparent as could be, and she was holding a little puppy, a little puppy dog with her. And, you know, I'm, I like to think of myself as someone who can think of a line now and then. And she, she went down the line and people doing interviews and down the line, down the line. And I, and I watch as she goes up to the door of the academy where, where she obviously has tickets. She's going in and they stop her. They don't let her in. I said, well, there is a God in heaven. You have to be a streaker to appear nearly naked at the Academy Awards. <laughs> and I, I forget about it. The next thing I know. She's coming down the line again. Only the one thing is different. She doesn't have her little puppy with her. Apparently, it wasn't her going in mostly naked. It was the idea of the puppy. So she she comes up and I, I said, just roll the camera. I, this isn't going to air, but I got to do this. It's okay. So they're rolling <laughs> the camera. I said, uh, Edie, you're back again. You want to let me take my puppy in? <laughs> I said, yeah, well, you know, funny thing, I can't see your puppy anymore, but I can still see your pussy. <laughs> <laughs> and he, at that point, was looking for the camera, and she moved on. And, and the camera... Okay. <laughs> and... line, but... <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. <laughs> He's here till Thursday. Try the veal. All right. That was great. Guys, 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 that's great. That's perfect. Um, we've done it again. We've we've run over a half hour. John, thank you so much. Uh, hopefully, we'll be doing many, many, many more of these. Uh, you're a fantastic guest. Gary, as always, thank great you. stories. Uh, and, of course, before we leave, we've got to do all of the plugs which includes, of course, the sister podcast, Get Off My Lawn with Tom Curley. Uh, it's the hysterically funny show that talks about life, the universe, and whatever the hell else I want to talk about. And uh, then, of course, we have to mention, hang on here. Do, 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 do. Uh, let's see what would be the best way to do this. We'll do this. We'll do this. And, of course, Serendipity, uh, Seeking Intelligent Life on Earth. Uh, oh, fool's errand if there ever was one. That is the blog that Gary, uh, his lovely wife Marilyn, and I and my wife Ellen contribute to. And uh, leastly but not lastly, we do have one or the one that I kept forgetting to mention, which is, of course, Voicecapes Audio Theater for the best in audio wow. theater and drama. I should know because I'm in it. So there you go. Gentlemen, I cannot thank you enough uh that's all for this episode we will see you again and uh until you, the next time yeah go ahead you know where to send my fee right yes i know where exactly <laughs> where to, exactly where well and we will all we will all get the same fee uh sadly hey you never know one day like i said we are on our way to a million subscribers we only have nine hundred thousand, and you know somewhat to go so anyway that's all for this show thanks everybody see you next time